So the Palestine mandate secured 1921 and 1922, as far back as that. On June 22nd, Churchill explained the British position on Zionism to the Dominion Prime Ministers, British Empire. If I can get this going. There you go. At a meeting of the Imperial Cabinet, among those present were the New Zealand Prime Minister, William Massey, Canadian Prime Minister, Arthur Megan. The Zionist ideal, Churchill told him, is a very great ideal, and I confess my, for myself, it is one of that claims, one that claims my keen personal sympathy. But the Balfour Declaration, he added, was more than an, an ideal. It was also an obligation made in wartime to enlist the aid of Jews all over the world, and Britain must be very careful and punctilious, he explained, to discharge our obligations. On July 5th, Dr. Wiseman, who had just returned from the United States, told Colonel Metzhagen, Meinertzhagen, okay, Meinertzhagen, that he feared for the future of Zionism. He says the British government is whittling down the Balfour Declaration. Meinertzhagen recorded in his diary, that immigration is practically stopped that the bulk of the British officers in Palestine are not in sympathy with the movement and that the Zionists are not getting those concessions which are necessary for the establishment of the home of the Jews in Palestine. So Lloyd George and Balfour both agreed that by the Balfour Declaration they had always meant an eventual Jewish state. One of the principal Middle East advisors at the colonial office, Major Young, himself favorably favored a a policy which he had written to Churchill on August 1st involved the gradual immigration of Jews into Palestine until that country becomes a predominantly Jewish state. And he went on to argue that the phrase national home, as used in the Balfour Declaration, implied no less than full statehood for the Jews of Palestine. The cabinet decided to retain the mandate, for as the official minutes recorded, stress was laid on the following consideration. The honor of the government was involved in the declaration made by Mr. Balfour and to go, actually Lord Balfour, and not and to go back on our pledge would seriously reduce the prestige of this country in the eyes of the Jews throughout the world. Nevertheless, also contained in the cabinet's conclusion was the, that warning that it was not expected that the problem would be easily or quickly solved, especially in view of the growing power of the Arabs in the territories bordering on Palestine. Churchill told the Arabs, you are not addressing your minds to the real facts of the case. And he wanted to say that he had no power or desire to repudiate the Balfour Declaration, nor did he believe that the Jews were in any way a threat to the Arabs. I have told you again and again that the Jews will not be allowed to come into the country except insofar as they build up the means for their livelihood according to the law. They cannot take any man's lands. They cannot dispose, dispossess any man of his rights or his property or interfere with him in any way. If they, like to buy, if, they, if they like to buy people's land, and people like to sell it to them, and if they, are, if they like to develop and cultivate regions now barren and make them fertile, then they have the right. And we are obliged to secure the right to come into the country and to settle. This, this is no longer an argument today. Later in the discussion, Churchill stated unequivocally that Britain could not grant representative government to Palestine because, as he said, we are trustees. <clears throat> not only for the interests of the Arabs, but also for the interests of the Jews. We have a double duty to, to dis discharge. The Arabs could not have representative government, he said, because that would give them the power to halt Jewish immigration. The British government, he added, wants to see Jews developing and fertilizing the country and increasing the population of Palestine. It was a great pity, he continued, that there were so few in Palestine, few people in Palestine, which had been once three or four times more populous. He wanted to see more wealth in Palestine instead of it being occupied by a few people who were not making any great use of it. How, how much is it is it, it has advanced despite all the violence because strictly because of the Jews. It was Britain, Britain's intention, Churchill declared, to bring more Jews in. We do not intend you to be allowed to stop more from coming in. You must look at the facts. During his final speech, he, Churchill, declared, the Jews are a very numerous people and they are scattered all over the world. This is a country where they have great historic traditions, and you cannot brush that aside as though it were absolutely nothing. They were there many years ago, hundreds of years ago. They have always tried to be there. They have done a great deal for the country. They have started many thriving colonies, and many of them wish to go and live there. It is to them a sacred place. Many of them go there to be buried in the city 
for they regard which they regard as sacred, as you regard it as sacred. Why cannot you live together in enmity, amity, and develop the country peacefully? There is room for all as long as they are not brought in in great numbers, before there are means of livelihood for them, before the electrical and other means of power are created, which will make waste waste places fertile, before the hills have had terraces made upon them, before irrigation and proper agricultural development. Of course, if they were brought in before these things were done, you would have a reason to complain. But there was progress every step of the way. The Jews have a far more difficult task than you. You only have to enjoy your own possession. But they have to try to create out of the wilderness, out of the barren places, a livelihood for the people they bring in, which they did. They have to bring in, them in under conditions which make for the general good of the population, and which, which it did, and which supplant no one and deprive no one of their rights and liberties. So the Rutenberg scheme. Before the mandate was finally itself finalized, the British government made a major contribution to the development of the Jewish national home. This took the form of granting the Zionists a monopoly control over the development of the electrical resources of Palestine, according to a scheme which had been drawn up by the Russian-born Jewish engineer Pinas Rutenberg to harness the waters of Palestine. The Rutenberg scheme was accepted by the British government as an integral part of its mandate commitment to the Jews. On May 24th, John Chuckberg sent Churchill the final draft of Sir Herbert Samuel's memorandum on the future of Palestine. In it, <clears throat> Samuel described as impracticable Weizmann's much-quoted remark of 1919 that Palestine would become as Jewish as England is, is English. The British government, Samuel insisted, have no such aim in view, nor did they wish to see the disappearance of the, or the subordination of the Arab population language or culture in Palestine. Samuel also stressed that the Balfour Doc Declaration did not contemplate that Palestine as a whole should be converted into a Jewish national home, but that such a home should be founded in Palestine. <clears throat> Samuel's memorandum went on to state once again that further Jewish immigration could not be permitted to exceed whatever they, the economy, economic capacity of the, the country at any time to absorb new arrivals. The Palestine White Paper. Samuel's statement was accepted by the Colonial Office as a guideline for future British policy and was published as part of the Palestine White Paper of 30 June 1922. The Zionists themselves formally accepted the White Paper, but they were unhappy about fixing so specific an economic condition on future immigration. Fearing that unsympathetic and even anti-Zionist high commissioners in the future would abuse the concept of an economic absorptive capacity in order to halt future immigration. Immigration. Churchill's defense in the House of Commons overwhelmingly approves of the Palestine mandate. Churchill spoke in defense of the Zionists July 4th, telling the House of Commons, anyone who has visited Palestine recently must have seen how parts of the desert have been converted into gardens and how material improvement has been affected in every respect by the Arab population dwelling around. On the, on the sides of the hills, there are enormous systems of terraces and they are now the abode of an active cultivating population, whereas before, under centuries of Turkish and Arab rule, they had relapsed into a wilderness. So it's pretty much up to the Jews to do this, and they did. There is no doubt whatever that in that country there is room for still further energy and development if capital and other forces be allowed to play their part. There is no doubt there is room for a far larger number of people, and this far larger number of people will be able to lead far more decent and prosperous lives. Apart from this agricultural work, this reclamation work, there are services which science, assisted by outside capital, can render, and of all the enterprises of importance, which would have the effect of greatly enriching the land, none was greater than the scientific storage and regulation of the waters of the Jordan for the provision of cheap power and light needed for the industry of Palestine, as well as water for the irrigation of new lands now desolate. <coughs> I recall that many times the Arabs would say that they don't care, they let the Palestine lay desolate. The granting of the Rutenberg concessions did not involve, Churchill said, injustice to a single individual. It did not take away one scrap of what was there before, and it offered to all the inhabitants of Palestine the assurance of greater possibility, prosperity and the means of a higher economic and social life. Critics of the Rutenberg concession had insisted and it was for the Arab majority to, to develop the economic wealth of Palestine. And if it were up to them, they wouldn't have done anything. Churchill sought to rebut this argument. I am told that the Arabs would have done it themselves. 
Who's going to believe that? Left to themselves, the Arabs of Palestine would not in a thousand years have taken effective steps towards the irrigation and electrification of Palestine, which the Jews did do. They would have been quite content to dwell a handful of philosophic people in the uh, wasted sun-scorched plains, letting the waters of the Jordan continue to flow unbridled and unharnessed into the Dead Sea. The House divided at the end of Churchill's speech. His appeal was successful. Only 35 votes were cast against the government's count Palestine policy and 292 in favor. So we can already see what was going to happen in the future. The more successful the Jewish population would be in Palestine, the more adamant and violent would be the, the uh, Arab reaction. The League of Nations approves the Palestine mandate. The success of the Rutenberg debate effectively freed the colonial office from the pressure of the anti-Zionists and left the way clear for presenting the final terms of the mandate to the League of Nations. On July 22nd, the League of Nations approved the Palestine mandate. Henceforth, the anti-Zionists, however strongly they expressed their criticisms, could not uproot the Jewish national home. And so the conflict begins, evolves, and uh, gets worse. Persecutions, riots, and refugees, 1923 to 1933. So the granting of the Palestine mandate to British provided Britain provided a major stimulus to Zionist enterprise and development, but it neither lessened Arab opposition to Zionism nor improved the lot of Jews elsewhere. Even Jewish settlements in Palestine were subjected to increasing difficulties, both economic and political. Palestinian Arab Congress, 6 October 1924. The daily slight frictions between Arab and Jew, whose ideas, principles, customs, and modes of life take dramatically divergent lines cultivate and solidify hatred between both communities. And there must come a time when it will accumulate to such a degree as to defy all moral and political restraints. And it did. It is a gross error to believe that Arab and Jew may come to an understanding if only each of them exchange his code of extremism for another of moderation. When the principles underlying two movements do clash, it is futile to expect their meeting halfway. Both Leopold Amory, then Colonial Secretary, and Winston Churchill, then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Curve, supported the proposed Zionist loan for the sole purpose of promoting and expediting close settlement by Jews on the land. Britain was all the way going forward to the progress of the Zionists, but the Cabinet rejected it, and in doing so marked a step away from what had earlier been regarded as one of Britain's obligations under the national home provisions of the mandate. There was a crack in the armor. Arab attacks on Jews spread throughout Palestine. As soon as things start going downhill, the Arabs rise up when they have the advantage. When the attacks ended at nightfall on August 29, 133 Jews had been killed. 87 Arabs had also died, mostly shot by British troops and police seeking to halt the violence. Notice the Jews weren't fighting back. The British troops were. Two weeks later, on September 29th, the new British High Commissioner of British Troops in Palestine, Sir John Chancellor, telegraphed to the Colonial Office. The latent, deep-seated hatred of the Arabs for the Jews has now come to the surface in all parts of the country. Threats of renewed attacks upon the Jews are being freely made and are only being prevented by visible presence of considerable military force, the British. That same day, at September 29, the British, the president of the Arab executive in Palestine, Musa Kazim Pasha, warned a senior British official in Palestine that unless the Jewish national home policy was changed, it would be an armed uprising. Musa Kasim Pasha added that such an uprising would involve not only the Arabs of Palestine, but participation of Muslims from Syria, Transjordan, and perhaps Iraq. In March 1930, the Shaw Report, head of the Commission of Inquiry, to examine the causes of Arab unrest, made it clear that British opinion was swinging slowly, but definitively against the Zionists. The Arabs are winning now. Violence works. Based on a second official report by Sir John Oak Simpson, October 1930, the British government issued a white paper intimating that future Jewish immigration might have to be curtailed even more rigorously than in the past. Following Wiseman's protests, Ramsey MacDonald agreed to abandon the immigration limiting clauses of the 1930 white paper. July 30th, uh, January 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler became German Chancellor and anti-Semitism took on an open, official, and a historical tone. Hitler predicted with what he called absolute certainty his name would be honored in all lands as the man who once for all exterminated the Jewish pest from the world. The new German persecutions combined with the continuing anti-Jewish feelings.